war all the time. You know? And it's really easy to forget that. You know, I, I remember one time quite recently, there was something going on in my life, and I thought, this is a bit strange, what's going on here? And then suddenly the penny dropped out, oh, there's a spiritual aspect to this. You know, suddenly everything made a lot more sense. You know, I'm not saying that everything that happens in life is part of our spiritual battle, but, but quite a lot is. Okay. Uh, and the second thing uh, is that our battle is not with people. Our battle is with spiritual powers. And I don't know about you, but if I'm really struggling with someone, it's easy to think that they're my problem. You know, and it's important to remember that while they may be the sort of the immediate problem, the problem I can see, the deeper problem, the deeper problem, the deep, deeper battle is with the spiritual powers, with, with spiritual powers, uh, spiritual wickedness, as it says in one version. So just encourage us all just, just to bear that in mind as we go through our lives, that the spiritual dimension there is uh, to our lives. Okay, I'm going to hand over to our worship team. like to stand or get yourself into readiness for worship this morning and um, we'll just pray together. We just thank you Heavenly Father that you are, that you are our Heavenly Father, that you know all about us, you know more about us than we know ourselves and than anybody else can know. Thank you that you know our beginning, you know our end. Nothing is a surprise to you. We just thank you this morning that you are a good father, that your nature is to love. We thank you that you are perfect in all of your ways. Thank you that whatever we're going through, whether we're on a mountain top or in a valley, whether we're in a shadowy place or whether we're in the sunshine, whether we are going through a storm or whether we're in the calm seas, you know all about it and you are the same God who loved us so much that you sent Jesus to die for us. So we just thank you that you make a way. We thank you that you, your timing is perfect. When we don't know what's happening in our lives, we don't know what's around the corner, you know what's around the corner. You don't always let us know for our own good, but you are working things out for our good. Thank you that your ways are perfect, your timing is perfect, everything about you is perfect, because that is who you are. So we praise you and worship you this morning for your great faithfulness, your grace, your mercy, and your love to us, and because you are the great I am. Thank you. 
asking us a question this morning about what can we see as we look into the future. Um, things have been very topsy-turvy, things have been upside down, things have been a bit crazy these last few months. But I think he's asking us to have, a, have another look into your own future with him. And 
think he wants to encourage each and every one of us that there is a good and perfect will of God for each and every one of us. It's, we need to find what that is, but always also understanding that he has a, a hope uh, and a future for us that is good, that is perfect, and we are forever in his hands. And we don't need to worry about tomorrow. Today has enough worries for itself. Don't worry about tomorrow. But look into the future with faith. Look into the future with the eyes of vision. Ask him to give you, to give you his vision, his eyes of what your future beholds. Uh, but seek, seek the perfect will of God and all, all will unfold for you. about Paul, I was thinking when we were singing the song that it might be difficult for some of us here to sing, you are perfect in all of your ways, you are perfect in all of your ways, when our own circumstances are very far from perfect, I think it's quite a challenge to, to, to sing those words, but I had an incident this week, because a certain situation is far from perfect, um, but the Lord um, enabled me to do something perfectly and that word was actually used I had to write something which was very very important and the feedback I got was that it was perfect, that word was used it was perfect, well nobody's ever said to me anything was perfect before but as I was singing that song the Lord was saying to me yes Rachel, circumstances can be far from perfect but when I'm in on it I can bring my perfection into it and I can help to see a way through so just as Paul was saying about um, a hope in the future that God has for us, uh, cling on to the fact that our God is a perfect God and he equips and he supplies, he encourages and he enables in his perfection.
Okay, uh, time for notices now. Uh, now, last week, uh, after the main service, we went out, out the back, uh, into the car park out there, and we had a, a, time, a time of worship, all singing out loud, and you know, I thought that was fantastic. You know, I really sang my heart out there, you know, I thought it was great. So we're doing the same again today. Uh, the weather is glorious, so you know, I'd encourage you, if you are able to stay with us, the main service is over. Please join us out the back there, of a great time of worshiping God. Uh, now, uh, there's a need in the church that we're going to pray for one now. Um, Becca, uh, Phil's wife, um, her sister, Jessica, uh, has COVID, uh, and it's also possible that there's her mom, Brenda, uh, has COVID too. Uh, and they're both in India, and if you've been keeping that on the news, you, you know the situation in India is, isn't great uh, just now. But our God is greater than that. Amen. 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 Our God is great. So I'm going to lead us in prayer for Jessica and Brenda now. Okay. Lord, Lord, we thank you for Jessica and Brenda. We thank you, Lord. They are your children. Lord, and as has been said, your perfection is available to your, to your children. We thank you, Lord, for your perfect healing, your perfect wholeness uh, in the lives of Jessica and Brenda. Uh, in Jesus' name. Are there any other notices? Anyone wants to bring? No? Okay, so just to mention regards to the offering. Um, as always, there's a sort of container at the back there. Uh, you can put your offering in if you wish. If you do that, please put it in, in an envelope, uh, clearly marked. Uh, also, you can put your money through the door during the week, or you can give through the direct money transfer. Speak to Paul. And also, um, we are at the moment renewing um, our gift aid scheme with the government. If you'd like to explore that further, if you'd like to be part of our gift aid scheme, please come and see me afterwards and I can furnish you with a form. Thanks. Okay. Uh, and now we move to communion. You know, all the good things God has done for us, all the good things God is doing for us, they all come back to the cross. They're all focused on the cross. Taking all his goodness in our lives, it comes back to the cross. It comes back to what Jesus accomplished on the cross. And as we take communion now, we remember that. So uh, let's take the bread. Next, we take the, the wine or the juice or whatever it is that you want. Okay, uh, Dave Smith is our speaker today. So Dave, why don't you come to the front? Thank you. Right, so uh, today we continue our series, as uh, Adam says, of weapons of our warfare. Well, put together like a, a, a what I call a smorgasbord of uh, thoughts. Um, smorgasbord for those who it's a Swedish dish, various things on it. So, I mean, it, to be kind, you could say, I'm going to give you a variety of stuff, but on the other hand, some, some would say it's a mishmash. So, <laughs> so, I hope it's going to be more of a variety. Yeah. <coughs> so, as Adam said, uh, He's no one from our point of view, so it's just fine. It's uh, just uh, when we become Christians, that is when we're born again, and that's the, the Bible definition of Christian. Uh, we, um, Jesus said, by the way, you must be born again in John chapter 3 and verse 3. 
you must be born again. So when we're born again, we're transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light, if you like. And to get that in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. It is then we find we, we have an adversary, the devil, who opposes the things of God. And his opposition includes the church and includes you and I as born again Christians. So, like it or not, we become part of this battle, this warfare. And it's a spiritual warfare, it's a, we have the invisible enemy, the spiritual battle that we fight. Ephesians 6 and verse 12 tells us that we, we are not contending against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we see from this there are various levels of demonic forces at work. And Satan himself was the, in the, the top of the kingdom, if you like, but then going down to hosts of wickedness. And the common denominator of all these is they, they dwell in darkness. But of course, in darkness, a person who is a non Christian, a person who can't see because it's dark, but the person is blinded, in effect. And that's exactly what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. The God of this world, and that's Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. So when we come to Jesus, Jesus says he is the light of the world. John chapter 8 and verse 12. And the verse goes on to say, he, Jesus says, he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So when we come to Christ, we, we come out of that darkness, and we, we come to Jesus who is the, the light of life. And he promises that he, he will, uh, as we follow him, we will have the light of life. Hallelujah. So given that we're part of this spiritual warfare, what is our response going to be? Well, we can either learn how to fight in this battle, in this warfare, or we can be more like spectators on the sidelines just watching others doing the fighting. Back, back in the 1970s, I mean, some of you may remember, <laughs> we learned a new word in uh, our vocabulary. The word was détente. And if you remember that word, détente. It's a, it's a French word meaning a release from tension. But in the 1970s, the, the way of reducing hostilities between America and Russia was to have this détente between the Nixon and Brezhnev. And uh, this détente meant compromise and meant making concessions. And I would say if we, if we take this option, then when we, be, we become easy prey for the devil, we become weak and ineffective. 1 Peter verse, chapter 5 verse 8 says, tells us to stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, while the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. So if we're, we're going making concessions and uh, compromise, then we have to be careful that the devil himself will come like a roaring lion and take us captive. We become weak and ineffective as Christians. We all know the story of David and Goliath, fantastic story in the, the 1 Samuel 17. But what about another story, a lesser known story, Saul and Goliath? As Goliath threatened and intimidated Israel at this time, Saul was in his tent, wandering round, wondering what to do. His armour was in the corner of the tent, not, not unused. So we, like Saul, just wandering what to do, wandering around, fearful of taking on that Goliath with our, our armour in the, in the corner of the tent. We want to be those that encourage people to be more like David who came along with fearless faith in the Lord is God and took on and defeated Goliath. He won a wonderful victory that day. We all have Goliaths, we all have mountains in our lives at times. 
And these Goliaths can take many forms. And uh, sometimes they're, they're, it's a daily battle to, to come across the, the stronghold in our own lives. That, that Goliath got to battle that into that Goliath. It's in, and sometimes it's external things which come out of nowhere. And as people of faith, we have, we have, we have no choice but to take on these personal Goliaths. And it is then that we need the support of other Christians. I mean, we've been through a battle recently with our own Goliath, Rachel and I and Emily. And uh, through the last months, we've, we've uh, battled through this. And uh, we've needed the support of other Christians, people who've advised us, prayed with us, stood on the word of God with us. So we want to thank people to, who've done that. And, and this battle is still ongoing. But sometimes the battle goes on for not just for a day or two, it goes on for years. And we've got to persevere and fight this Goliath. Fight the mountain. Of course, we know the Ephesians 6 passage about the war, the um, weapons of warfare. It tells that the hosts of darkness are in heavenly places in Ephesians 6, verse 12. And many people may think that demons actually dwell in hell. But the scriptures reveal there are actually several heavens. The Apostle Paul spoke of the third heaven. In uh, 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 2. So, logically speaking, there is to be a first and a second heaven. And the first heaven is reckoned to be the realm of the sun, moon, and stars, the physical heavens, if you like. The second heaven is reckoned to be where Satan's kingdom is. He's called the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. So, the third heaven is the dwelling place of God. And that is why, maybe why our prayers are sometimes hindered, because they have to go through and have to traverse the second heaven to get into the third heaven, which is God's kingdom. And the second heaven is, if it's Satan's kingdom, then we, we have to traverse that, and there might be barriers and hinder, hindrances to overcome. We can think of Daniel's prayer in the Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, how Daniel's prayer was delayed and hindered for 21 days by the uh, Prince of Persia before the answer came. So sometimes we have to really pray through the problem. And initially, we have barriers and hindrances. We've got to pray through and break through into the heaven, into God's kingdom, the third heaven. So when our personal problems fill our minds, we are far more, far, far more likely to be depressed, if you like, and more passive in relation to spiritual warfare and the spiritual battle. In effect, we withdraw from um, in, in kind of mental monastery, giving victory to the devil by default. Yet the New Testament gives us much encouragement not to uh, so to, to come to these kind of depressing thoughts, but to fight the good fight of faith, it says in 1 Timothy 6.12, to resist the devil, James chapter 4, verse 7. To take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God in Ephesians 6 17. And this is a, a key point I'm going to make now. Basic to all victory over the devil is the confident use of God's Word. Basic to all victory over the devil is the confident use of God's Word, the truth, to apply it against the lies, the deceits, the misquotes of the devil. Our example is Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 4, when uh, four times in this account with the devil he said, it is written, it is written, and uh, he was quoting scriptures at the devil. And the same weapon is available to us, God's word. Here's another key point, Satan cannot face the word of God, thrust at him by the believing heart and the power of the spirit. Well, I hear an amen, amen. Satan cannot first not face the word of God thrust into him by the believing heart and the power of the Holy Spirit. So a key thing in our warfare is to focus on our opposition rather than our condition, which I've said in other sermons before. It's, it's a key point. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 tells us we are raised up with Christ and made to sit with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 
Paul mentioned the other week, last week, the story of Jehoshaphat, who faced a vast army coming against him. And after crying to God in prayer and fasting, a battle plan was revealed. And the first thing was, take up your position. So we've got to be aware of our position rather than our condition. If we focus on our condition, we can end up depressed and defeated. Take up your position, God said to them. Stand still and see the victory of the Lord on your behalf. Second Chronicles 20, 17. So we've got to focus on our position. There are times we actively need to fight the devil. And there are times we need to stand still and just allow him to work on our behalf. As directed by the Holy Spirit. We have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. What, is he, what does he require? Does he want us to fight this battle? Or does he want us to stand still and let him, let him do the fighting? He is our captain, Lord of hosts in this warfare. So another example I can think of is when the Amalekites came against Israel in Exodus chapter 17. And you remember the story that Joshua went to lead the army, but Moses said, I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. This is uh, Exodus 17 verse 9. Of course the rod was symbolic of his authority. And in spiritual warfare a key thing is to know we have authority in Christ. This is uh, Matthew 28. Jesus has given us authority. Moses went up to the top of the hill. That is, he took up his position. And then, verse 11, he held up his hands. He was praying. And when his hands started to grow weary because of all the praying, the battle was being won by the Amalekites. So he needed support. He needed the support of Aaron and her who came alongside and literally supported his arms in the air so he could pray. And with their support, Joshua prevailed in the battle and the Amalekites were defeated. You remember the story of Joseph, uh, Moses set up an altar at the time and he called the altar Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is my banner. He's a banner which we can all gather around, the Lord is our banner. So in Ephesians 6, we, um, going back to, I'm saying this is small, it's Mark, it's Mark as well, so we're going to Ephesians 6, which is a well-known passage on the, the armour. We have the uh, five pieces of armour for the, for the defence, and they can be summarised, I'd rather go through it all, because we've, we've, had, we've had messages that have been spoken every five minutes, but basically we have truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation. Five pieces of armour, which they represent truth, righteousness, peace, faith and salvation. That we should know in our lives, so that we can come in with confidence in, in fighting the battle. To know that we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. To know that we're saved and born again, we have salvation. To know the truth. When we know who we are in Christ, we have confidence to fight the battle. If, if you're unsure of your, your place in Christ, then uh, you know, you're going to be easy to meet for the enemy. The full armour of God, which God tells us to put on, is, gives us protection, of course. And then Paul speaks about two weapons to attack the enemy. And of course, the first one is the sword of the Spirit, which is, we've spoken about a lot recently, which is the Word of God. But the second weapon mentioned is prayer. Ephesians 6, 18, pray at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So that not in that verse. Well, pray at all times in the Spirit. We've got to keep alert in our prayers. And we've got to persevere in our prayer. And we've got to pray with supplication for all the saints, to pray for other Christians. So we should pray in the Spirit. Uh, Romans 8 26 tells us the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us. We also have to be alert. And Jesus Himself told us to be alert. And uh, speaking of the, I think it was Luke 21, we 
we speak of the end times and you know, the, the fact that Jesus is going to come back, we just tell us, be alert. We want to be, able to be alert for that time, which is right now, basically. Yeah. And that verse I read earlier about the, the devil carrying around, around like a roaring lion, we've got to be alert and be aware of the, the devil's attack. Yes, yes, I could. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jesus spoke of the believer's authority in Matthew 18 and verse 18. Jesus tells you, I tell you the truth, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. It's an interesting verse. And I believe it's just saying the application of that is that our Lord's victory at the cross when he came to destroy the works of the devil is now in the hands of the church. As we forbid things on earth, as led by the Spirit, I think the King James says, whatever you bind on earth shall be forbidden, shall be binded. Jesus puts the initiative for action in the hands of his people, the church, and promises that when we act, Heaven will endorse what we say. And the key thing is uh, the verse 4 in that which talks about unity, it's not about agreement. If two or three of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them. So that's an important thing to say. God is waiting, in a sense, for us to, to have initiative and pray. So that when we pray, the whole all of heaven endorses what we say. Another passage of interest to me, I found, was uh, Matthew 12, 29. How can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? So I believe that's just saying to us, in any spiritual warfare situation that we face where there's an attack of the enemy, we need to ask ourselves, who is behind this? What is behind it? Well, we can ask the Holy Spirit to reveal what's going on. And he will give us the answer. One of the spiritual gifts is uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, the ability to distinguish between spirits. In verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 12. So the Lord may just give us a word, may say control, it may say manipulation, he may say lust. So we've got to, we've got to find it. What's going on behind the scenes, as it were? And when we can bind the strong man and plunder his, his house, and plunder his goods. And I believe this speaks even of evangelism, that uh, to release non Christians from the domain of darkness. We've got to plunder the, the, the domain of darkness and take captives, people from that place. And Jesus indeed was anointed to uh, bring, make the captives free. So in conclusion, really, I just want to say that I think um, most of us here believe we're living in the last days. There is a war to fight in the last days, obviously. Satan is having a last-ditch attempt to defeat the purposes of God. And evil of all kinds is flooding our world. But the signs of the times that Jesus mentioned in, in Matthew are being met before our very eyes. Far our own eyes. Surely now is the time to pray. I spoke to Paul and Christie, you know, I believe as leaders we ought to see, we ought to encourage obviously uh, more prayer in our church. Prayer is not just incidental to God's work, but prayer is the work. And that's where I see people miss it. We want the church to do pack up prayer meetings. Prayer is not just incidental to God's work, it is the work. Let's pray for one another in the church. Ephesians chapter 1 and 2 gives us some tremendous ideas how to pray for one another in the church. Plenty of things there to go at. And if you're a married couple in the church, do you pray with one another? There's tremendous power as Christians, as, as couples pray in unity and agreement. And uh, I'd encourage all the married couples to pray together to pray in our connect groups. 
And I would, I would love to see more people at our prayer meeting on Tuesday night. We have a Bible study and worship and all sorts of prayer. And we need to be people who, who per persevere and continue to pray, not to give up like some churches have done. So a quick recap of what I said earlier. Really. We're all in a warfare. We don't just want to be spectators. We want to be involved and fight the battle. We want to be more like David, not Saul, and to face our Goliaths, face our mountains, whether it's in some kind of sickness or whether it's some battle that we're facing. We've got to enlist the support of others in this battle, other Christians to, to support us. We don't want to be bogged down in personal problems and defeat. We want to know and use God's word and to speak it with authority. We've got to focus on our position and on our condition. We've got to pray. We've got to rely on the Holy Spirit. We've got to be alert. We've got to bind the strong man. We've got to pray in agreement to be effective. So to end with, I've just got a verse from the 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 and 5. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down the strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Amen. I'm going to just close the closing prayer, but we're going to close the meeting prayer as well. And then we're going out outside for a sink, which would be great. So let's, let's pray. Father, we recognize that we are in a battle with an adversary. Thank you for the armor that you provide. Lord, remind us, help us to wear it every day. Thank you for our weapons, Lord, the sword of the Spirit, your word, and the weapon of prayer. Lord, teach us how to pray effectively and use these weapons to see the enemy defeated in our own lives and in the church and even beyond the church. For we pray in the victorious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So God bless you.